Okay, what does God say? This is our message this morning. Um, the Lord put this very, very clearly on my heart. I had already planned, I had already started preparing to go back to one of the, uh, one of the series that we had been doing about precious things from 1 Peter, right? And I don't remember what day of the week, and I was praying, oh, Lord, is that what I should do? And the Lord very, very clearly put this on my heart. So this is actually, a, um, in a way, a continuation, and I guess it is, from last week. Um, if you haven't had a chance to, to, uh, to take in the service and listen to the message from last week, I really urge you to. It's, it was a very clear message that the Lord has for us as we go into 2024. Not because I'm so great, but because the Lord is so great and the, the Lord had a message for us. So I feel, this, I feel very strongly about this one as well, but let's see what the Lord has to say to us. And so what does God say? So um, I, I want to start off by, by telling you a story, a true story, true story, and then we will look at this. Uh, if it's going to take you a while to find this in your Bible, you can turn to the Old Testament book of Haggai. You say Haggai? Where is Haggai? Uh, $50 for the person who finds it first. <laughs> or Haggai. As we, as, as, so some of you are going to say, is it Haggai or Haggai? It is pronounced both ways, depending on where you're from. So I may do it both ways as well. So anyhow, it's going to be from the book of Haggai, a book probably that we don't read very much. It's way tucked back in the Old Testament. And um, if you're familiar with this book, then you're really going to see, oh, what does God say? It's very clearly in the book of Haggai. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, can I borrow $50 from somebody? <laughs> when we were, you, you can, <laughs> Lisa, you scared me. <laughs> It's so easy when we use our phones these days, right? Just beep, 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 beep. Let me tell you, in the, in, the, in the country that cannot be named, ask Anil, <laughs> okay? Um, in, in both of the places, there, I, I, don't know, I, I don't know how it worked. I think we've mentioned it before. So it was pastors, uh, it was uh, pastor couples. So husband, wife, husband, wife, all the way around. We'd sit in a circle. And the way usually it was done, whoever was speaking would give the scripture reference, right? And then in the group, as John knows, because he was there, whoever found it first would then uh, start reading it. And let me tell you what, in both places, it was amazing. They were faster than we are on our phones to find it. And there was one woman, she was, she was a pastor also. I think maybe she had a, a different background literally Anil, for example, or I would, the scripture would be coming out of our mouth and before the translator could get to it, boom, she'd have it and she'd start reading it the whole time, the, the whole time. And I think one time that she's, and uh, Anil to forestall it, just to include others, Anil said, okay, someone else, would you read the scripture? But anyhow, Sister Lisa, good for you. I'll have to buy you a cup of coffee. She found, she found Haggai or Haggai. So um, let me tell you a story as we start this. What does God say? So um, this is from my mom's side of the family. So I have a cousin, Tammy, who is almost exactly my same age. Um, and uh, we, were, we were very close, although we lived quite far apart. We, whenever we would get together, we were very close. So uh, she's the one that um, just things happened in her life, and she went very, very far from God. She ran away from home. She went very, very far, uh, just so far from God. She was living in a commune somewhere. I think this was like, you know, way back when, because I'm a little bit older. Um, this was sort of the end of the Jesus people movement in, in the U.S. And so she was living in a commune uh, with a guy and a bunch of others. And, um, and she got saved, really, really saved. God changed her life. And she didn't, she didn't know any better. And later on when we talked, and, and we had really been praying for her, and Grandma, of course, had been praying for her. This is the intro to the story. We're going to talk about her kid in just a minute. Um, so, but she was the one. She got saved, really saved. And every night she knew, okay, I want to read the Bible. I want to get close to God. And so she would get high, she'd smoke pot, and then she'd read the Bible. 
because she didn't know any better. Now, you were looking at me like, whatever. You know, that's life. People have all sorts of things. And she, 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 she'd smoke pot, get high, and then she'd read the Bible. Oh, it was, it was, it was I'm not advocating that, <laughs> by, by the way, okay? And then about two weeks after she'd gotten saved, she'd gotten high, and she was reading the Bible, and something kind of came in her heart, and she thought, I, this isn't right. I don't think I should be getting high and reading God's Word. And she stopped. Um, so that's my cousin, Tammy. That's not, the, the moral of that part of the story is, you know what? Uh, when people get saved, God can clean up their lives. He can. It, it's not legalism. It's not whatever. God can clean up people's lives when he gets their hearts. God can clean up anything when he has our hearts, right? Anything. So anyhow, uh, and then she realized I shouldn't be living with this guy either. Uh, he got saved too. And so they got married and they had a child. So, you know, they were part of the Jesus pe people movement. And so they had a son and they named him Pilgrim. <laughs> so I I've never met anybody else. Now, but you know, that kind of, that was sort of their, you know, their lifestyle. So they were very godly and they'd pray about everything. And so, um, so Tammy and her husband and Pilgrim, you know, they were teaching him to be a good boy and to be a godly boy and to pray about everything. And so one Christmas when Pilgrim was about, th about four years old, he was three or four, they had already bought Christmas presents and um, Pilgrim had seen a bicycle, but it was really expensive and they, they couldn't afford it because they, di they didn't have a lot of finances and they'd already bought him a present. And he came to me and said, I want this bicycle. I want this bicycle. And Tammy said, Pilgrim, we, we can't have it. But I want it. But I want it. And so finally, Tammy said, well, you're going to have to ask God. Because, you know, they, they, were, they really loved God. They were really walking in God's ways. And so Pilgrim went off to his room. About 30 minutes later, he came back. Mommy, I asked God. <laughs> and so what do you say when your child says, I ask God, right? So being a good mother, she said, what did God say? And Pilgrim said, Pilgrim, you can have it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and, and he did. He changed his voice for God's voice, right? <laughs> so, so, of course, did Pilgrim get the bicycle for Christmas? Of course he did. <laughs> Grandma bought it. <laughs> gra gra Grandma bought it. <laughs> Tammy and her husband definitely didn't have enough money, but, you know, when God says, you can have it, you know, what are you, you going to do? So um, what does God say? What does God say? Now, the message this morning is not like that, <laughs> okay? But I wanted, to, I wanted to just share that with you anyhow. Um, God speaks to... Now, did God, did God really tell Pilgrim, Pilgrim, you can have it? I don't know. Maybe he did. Because um, God speaks to every heart. As I was saying this morning when we were praying... Uh, we have the example of Samuel in the Bible, right? Very, very early. Samuel had a heart for God. Samuel, is that where your name comes from? Samuel in the Bible? <laughs> Great job, Mom and Dad. <laughs> but Samuel had a heart for God. When you've got a heart for God, God can speak to you and can touch your heart any time. He, he can, um, as he did with Samuel when Samuel was very young. Um, so... We're going to talk today about what does God say, and uh, it's going to come from the book of Haggai, or Haggai, and it's going to sort of follow on from last week. So let's do a little bit of history, and some of you are going to say, wah, wah, history is not your favorite. I don't know any of you, do you love history? A few of us? A few of us, yay, we love history. So let's do a little bit of history, and then let's see, and then let's see what God says. Um, so last week we talked about this. The Jewish nation had been uh, taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, had been taken to Babylon, and then in a, because they had not followed God, they had stopped following him. They were worshiping idols, and God allowed their sin. God allowed them to feel the consequences of their sin. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And then miraculously, after 70 years, somehow, suddenly, another conqueror came in from the Persian Empire. 
His name was Cyrus. And overnight, literally overnight, he came in and he conquered his empire, conquered Babylon. Overnight. Miraculous. If you go back and read history, uh, early history, you can read about it. But it was, some, it, was, it was a miraculous. The gates were somehow left open. Uh, Cyrus and his army uh, dammed up the river. And so the river that protected the city was very low, and they came in that way miraculously overnight. And Cyrus, who was not a Christian at all, who did not acknowledge God at all, out of the blue, seemed to say, all of you Jews who have been captives, you can go back to your home. You can go back to your homeland. Hundreds and hundreds of miles away. Not only that, but here, all of the things that Nebuchadnezzar the uh, Babylonian emperor, all the things that he stole from the temple of God. Here, take it back, and I'll, we, will, we will help you rebuild the temple of God. A miracle, a miracle. Now, it's not here, but let me read you in Isaiah 44. Those of you that like history, and those of you even that don't, let me read something to you from Isaiah 44, 28. I am the Lord who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt. And of the temple, let its foundations be laid. Then let me read one more verse from Isaiah 45, 13. I will raise up Cyrus in my righteousness I will make his way straight. He will rebuild my city and set my exiles free, but not for a price or a reward, says the Lord Almighty. Now, some of you are saying, that's a little bit boring. Why does that matter? Do you know why it matters? Isaiah wrote this 150 years years before Cyrus was born. 150 years. Wasn't even born. The Persian kingdom was nothing at that time. And God said, I will raise up Cyrus. I will call him by name. He will do what I have planned for him to do. He will do this for my people. So I, you may not be encouraged by a history lesson. I'm encouraged by a history lesson this morning. What you can know is this. God knows everything and God can do anything on behalf of his people. You are in God's hands. Not only are you in God's hands, all the people around you, all of the situations around you, all of the tough bosses, all of the difficult this, all of the difficult that. It's in God's hands. It's in God's hands, and he can do what he wants to do. You stick with him, and you follow him. So that's the history background. But let's go on, and let's look as we go ahead. So they come back. They, Cyrus writes a decree, and he, says, uh, and he says, let them go back. And they go, and there's a prophecy. We looked at this last week. This is from the message. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was the governor who begins to rebuild the temple. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Amen. Amen. Not by might and not by power. Or as we said last week, you cannot do this by yourself. You will need my help. That's a... That's a, that's a, an easy translation. So the thing that God had for them, the thing that they were going to do, this thing that looked almost impossible, God comes in and he encourages them. He brings them back and then he says, now this is how you're going to do what, what I've called you to do. So what I want to say to each one of you this morning, especially if there's something in your heart, yeah? God, I'm praying for this. God, I'm asking for this. God, I'm believing for this, even when it's hard to believe, and I'm going to keep on praying. But it seems so great, and it seems so grand. It will not be by might. It will not be by power. It will be by the Spirit of the Lord, and He will be with you. And so that's how they come back. They come back to the land. Now, as they come back, who leads them? Zerubbabel, who's the governor. 
Joshua, who's the high priest. They return with great joy, with anticipation, with hope, with plans and dreams. They settle in their towns, and then they gather to rebuild. Okay, now let's start in Ezra, then we're going to go to Haggai. When the exiles arrived at the Lord's temple in Jerusalem, some of the leaders of the clans gave free will offerings to help rebuild the temple on its old site. They gave as much as they could for this work, and the total came to a lot. Okay, it came to a lot. It's huge. So let's pause here for just a minute, and I want you to see something. Look at what the leaders do. And before you say, that's leaders, that's not me, what I want to say to you as we look at that is this. Every one of you is a leader in some way. Every one of you. You say, no, I'm not. I I'm a follower. No, I'm not. I don't have any position. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a worship leader. I'm not on the board. Everyone has influence. If you have influence in some way, you are leading. You're a leader in some way. Every one of us. That's just, that's just the way it is if you have influence. So I want you to look at this picture of these leaders. And I want you to see three things very quickly and just very briefly. So what is it? What's special about this short passage? I'll bet if you've read this before, you've just read it and you've kept on going. But look at something here this morning. The leaders of the clans gave free will offerings. What do they give? Has Cyrus told them to give? Has Cyrus said, now this is what you should do because you're a leader? Is that what, he, is that what happens? What type of offering is it? What type of offering? It's free will. What does that mean? It's voluntary. They choose to give. Let me tell you what God wants from us. God wants free will from us. That's what he wants from us. That's what he's looking. He's not looking for people who, oh, I've got to obey the law because this, 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 and this. That's what the Pharisees did. And the Pharisees the, were the most hypocritical, sanctimonious bunch of people. They're the ones that helped put Jesus to death. What God is looking for is those. It's free will. It comes from our hearts because we will do it. Now, what else do we see here to help rebuild the temple? The second thing I want you to see is this. Their giving met a need. It met a need. So this morning as we think about giving, is there a need? Is there a need? A need in any area. You say, oh, well, that's finances and I don't have a lot of money. Finances is part of it. And you may not have a lot of finances, but everybody has the same 24 hours a day. You, say, you let me, you, if you say, no, I'm, I don't have enough time, let, let me look at your watch. Or, well, you, you guys don't use watches, right? Oh, I'm a dinosaur. You look at your phones, right? Seriously, how many of you are wearing watches this morning? Uh, you're dinosaurs too, okay? <laughs> we can be dinosaurs together. You're looking at your phones. We all have the same time. We all have some resources. And they give and it meets a need. And then I want you to see one other thing. Verse 69, what does it say? They gave as much as they could. They gave as much as they could. Nobody told them to. Nobody pressed them to. It came from their hearts. We're going to talk about hearts today. So we see this. And then they settle in their towns. They were settled. And then they meet in Jerusalem to rebuild the altar. That's where they start. That's their priority. So I want you to see something this morning as we, as we talk about... Whoop, as we... That did that all by itself. I didn't... I waved my hand, and it moved. Wow. <laughs> they began to rebuild the altar of God so that they could burn sacrifices. So I want us to see something. They've been living in Babylon. They come back to Israel. What is their priority? What is their priority? Their priority is the temple of God. What is their heart? They give free will offerings, and they begin to do the work of the Lord according to the instructions of the Lord. They're afraid, but they still begin to rebuild the temple of God and they rebuild the offer, the altar, even though they were afraid. And then what happens? What happens to them is what happens to everybody. Listen, what happens to them is what happens to everybody who makes the commitment 
God, I'm going to follow you. God, I'm going to commit to you. God, this year, I'm going to be serious about my walk with you. God, enough of this playing around. I'm going to walk in your ways, and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be serious about this. And what happens to them is what happens to us when we make a commitment. Distractions, division, disruption comes in. And so what happens as they rebuild the temple is this. The enemies come in and the work of God stops. And it stops for 20 years. 20 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. And in the middle of it, what happens? Along come Haggai and Zechariah in the name of God, and they begin to prophesy. They begin to give the word of God to them. So here we come to part of the title. What does God say? What does God say? We all have circumstances. We all have situations. We are all surrounded by discouragement and enemies. All of us have difficulties to overcome. All of us have, if you want to think about it this way, enemies that are around us. All of us have things that influence us in another way, just like these people. But then God's word comes in and they begin to rebuild. So, what does Haggai say? What does God say? Are you ready? So now we're in Haggai on August 29th. By the way, this is 520 BC. Do you know that this book, these two books are one are the best books along with Daniel and, and a couple of other books. We can date them exactly. We know exactly when they were written. Uh, we know exactly when it took place because it's, in, it's, it's recorded in history. So these dates are exactly exact. The Lord gave a message through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the chief priest. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies says. These people are saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Hang on to this this morning. If you're a little bit sleepy right now, shake yourself and wake up again. The people say, so here's God looking, and he says, these people are saying, because you know what? God knows what we say. God knows what's in our hearts, even if we don't say it. And God looks at his people that he has delivered. God looks at his people that he has saved. God looks at his people that were prisoners of war in Babylon. And he says, I brought them out. I've worked miracles for them. I arranged 150 years before he was even born. I arranged that a Persian king named Cyrus would come into Babylon and then he would find out from the prophets that the God of heaven had called him by name and Cyrus would recognize God has something for me to do and I have to let these people go and return to Jerusalem so that they will rebuild the temple. Miracle upon miracle upon miracle upon miracle. And yet... These people say, after all God has done, these people say, after all the blessings that have been poured out, these people say, mm, it's not time to rebuild the house of God. We'll do it later. That's what these people say. Then the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you to be living in your paneled houses while my house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. So here's our challenge this morning, brothers and sisters. We say something about our lives. We say something about our circumstances. We say something about our jobs. We say something about our troubles. We say something about our families. We say something about our problems. This is how it is. This is how it is. 
But our challenge is this. We say this. What does God say? It's not what we say. It's what God says. It's what God says. And so this morning as we're here, this morning as we're looking ahead to 2024, young people, as you're looking ahead where you are at your age, as you're, as you're looking ahead at choices you're going to make about your studies, schools you're going to go to, uh, the people that are around you, those that influence you. Can I talk about influencers just a minute? I hate, I hate it. I, how many, no, don't answer that question. I'm so glad we don't have TikTok in Hong Kong. We don't, do we? We don't have TikTok in Hong Kong. With all of the influencers. I had my phone, okay, sorry, I'm just going to speak frankly. I had my phone, and I have a news feed on my phone. And there are all these stories that came in, and there was a whole bunch of stuff from the Kardashian family. Sorry, I said the name all these influencers. And you know what I did? I see fewer stories. Stop receiving stories. We're all influenced. We are. Oh, this TikToker or that influencer. This is what it's like. This is what you should be doing. You should buy this. You should buy that. We live in a world that people say this. And we have all of these voices. We have all of these voices coming into our lives, right? Uh, no joke. Honest. I know you think I'm a dinosaur, young people. But it's true. Joshua, is it true? Go ahead and say, yes, it's true. Thank you. Thank you. $50 for you, too, at the end of the service. Can I borrow money? I need more money now. But we have, I, we're, we're, I'm making it a little bit light, but it's really true. We have all of these things, voices coming in. And let's be honest, a lot of times we have friends saying all sorts of things, too. I sometimes hear people say, well, my friend said this. And I think, are you serious? Are you really going to listen to that? We hear all of, all, all of these things. The key is, and the question is, you say this, but what does God say? What does God say? And God looked at his people and he says, is it really time for you to be living in your paneled houses? Now, how many of you have paneled houses? It's not very common in Hong Kong, uh, is it? is very common in the U.S. It's very, very common. Do you know what it means? It means a fancy house. It's kind of like living up on the peak on the island. It's, it's really nice. Because most people didn't have paneling, it would have just have been stone and, and covered with mud and things like that. So what had happened was this. When distractions had come and they had stopped rebuilding the, ha stopped rebuilding the house of God, what did they turn to instead? they started rebuilding their own homes. Why? Because it was easier. Why? Because it would make them more comfortable. Why? Because they could enjoy it more. It was hard to come back from Babylon to, to, to Jerusalem. It was. Because in Babylon, they'd had good homes. They had easy access to food. They had entered government. They had good jobs. A lot of them had become quite wealthy. Life really, although it was in captivity, life was easier in Babylon. And then here they came to Jerusalem, and Jerusalem was ruins. Jerusalem was this and that and broken down houses. And here they were. And then when it got difficult to rebuild the house of God, what did it become easier to do? To build their own homes. And the priority that had been first in their hearts, God, what you want and your ways, that's my first priority, instead became, what do I want? What is easy for me? What is comfortable for me? What will I enjoy more? And the people began to build not just a place to live. God doesn't begrudge anyone a roof over their heads. But the point was, they began to bless themselves instead of blessing God. It makes sense, doesn't it? The natural man, our natural selves, will always, will always, will always find confirmation for what it wants. Does that make sense? It will. It will. If I want something, I'll find somebody who will agree with me. And I will. Friends will agree with me. 
If I want something that may be different from what God wants, circumstances will suit what I want. If I want something instead of what God wants, very soon everything around me will say, yeah, this is how it should do and this is how it should be. And God steps in because they're his people. And he says, you're saying this, but this is what I say. And young people and all of us, but are really young people this morning, I know you, maybe you would have preferred to be on the fourth floor, um, but I'm so glad you're here with us this morning because you know what? This voice that you hear and the voice of God, these are things that will change the course of your life. It will set the direction for your life, just as it will for all of us who are, old, who are older than you are. You are facing crossroads now. You're facing decisions now. You're facing choices now that will make a difference in the rest of your life. And what I want to say to you is, who are you listening to? What does God say? What does God say about these choices? What does God say about your priorities. This is a question for all of us. Young people, I hope you don't think I'm just picking on you. Do you think I am? You get $50 after the service too. <laughs> I'm really gonna be poor. But you know what I'm saying, right? We all have choices to make. And this example from the Old Testament, you say, oh, pastor, that's an Old Testament story that took place 2,500 years ago. You're right. This took place 2,500 years ago, but it's there for a lesson for us. And so what God says is, think about your ways. Do you know what this means, your ways? That means very simply, think about your life. Think about the way that you're living right now. So for all of us, young people, adults, all of us, what God is saying is, think about the way you're living your life right now. Think about the choices that you're making. Think about the choices that you have made. Pay attention to them. And this is what I say. This is what I say about your life. Now, I want to say something. God loves us. God cares about us. God has good plans for our life. God does not condemn. God does not judge. Jesus took condemnation. Jesus took all judgment at the cross. Get that straight. Get that straight. So this is not a message of condemnation. But it is a message to us, all of us, whatever our age, to consider our ways. What does God say? Now, here's what God says. By the way, uh, I'll say that in a minute. God says, pay attention. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat but are not satisfied. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but are not warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. What I want you to see is this. Here is what they hoped for. Here is what they expected. Here is what they worked for in their lives. But the reality was here instead of here. So I have a question for you this morning. New Testament Christians, what are the expectations of your life? What are you hoping for in your life? What are you working for in your life? Here it is. And the question from God is, what you're working for, what you're hoping for, what you're giving your time and attention and energy to, is it meeting that expectation or is it somewhere back here? God has the answer for that, doesn't he? God has the answer. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, and not just life, brothers and sisters, not just life, young people, not just, okay, I'll be a good guy, I'll be a good girl, and I'll go to church, and I'm not going to do bad, bad things. I'm not going to smoke pot and get high like pastor's cousin Tammy did. I'll be good, but I'm going to live this way. I, 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 really mean, I really mean that because there are so many Christians, so many, everywhere in Lighthouse, and in every church around the world and outside of the world who are playing church. We're playing with God. 
I, I'm not being mean this morning. We're playing with God. I'm good. I'm not going to be bad, but I'm going to live like this. That's what the children of Israel were doing. That's what they were doing because you know what? They went back, we're going to rebuild the altar of God. And then it got difficult to rebuild the altar of God. So their priorities changed. Well, let's do this instead. It's what I want to do. I'll be really comfortable. I'll be this and I'll be that. Did they stop offering all, uh, sacrifices on the altar? Did they tear down the altar? No. The altar was still there. You can read all of these books. As far as I can tell, they continued to offer sacrifices on the altar that they had built. They continued to do these religious things. They continued to do these things, but their hearts had changed. They continued to do all of these outward things, but there was something wrong on the inside. And God says, you say this, but what I say is this. And brothers and sisters, I urge you, I beg you, hear my heart. I'm not judging, I'm not condemning, but the time has come for all of us, all of us. God, God, what do you say? God, what do you say about my life? It, it, honestly, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what Haggai says. It doesn't matter what Zechariah says unless they're giving the message of God. And if it's the message of God, then it matters. It matters. What God says matters. It makes a difference in their lives. They wanted to have a good life. Guess what? God wants you to have a good life too. They wanted to have an abundant life. What did Jesus say? I've come to give you life. Not just life, but abundant life. Overflowing life. Joyful life. Does it mean no problems? It does not mean no problems. It does not. But God will be with you in the problems. And God will give you joy in the journey. And in the darkness, God will shine his light. And in the presence of the enemy, he will spread a table before you. And you will have enough to eat. And you will be satisfied in your spirit. And when you don't know which way to go, he will lead you in paths of righteousness. When you are lost, this is what God does. God wants you to have abundant life. He, he doesn't want you to have a bad, poor, pitiful life. That's not the God we serve. And God looks at these people, and if you, if you will, I, I look at this, and I, what I see is a heart, I want to be careful, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to preach heresy, but the tone of this, and the heart of this, is that God looks at his people, and, and he's disappointed, and he's broken hearted, not because you're so bad, but because they're his people, he loves them, and they're living below what he has for them. And so God says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Now, go up into the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Brothers and sisters, it's time to rebuild the house of God. In the Old Testament, we look at this and we think, why does God care about a temple? God fills the universe. Why does he need a house with timbers? It wasn't about the house. It was about their hearts. It wasn't about the house. Let me say that again. It was about their hearts. Brothers and sisters, it's always about our hearts. It's always about our hearts. And if God has our hearts, God can do anything. If God has our hearts, God will pour out abundant blessings upon us and that for which we hope and that for which we work and that for which we give our energy will be more than satisfied and will be more than met. God wasn't trying to get a temple from them. He wanted their hearts and he wanted their priorities. Now look at what else he says. This is what God says, right? What does God say? You hoped for rich harvests, but they were poor. And when you brought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, said the Lord of our heaven's armies. Uh, that means Lord of hosts or Lord Almighty. That's, I, I left it that way so you could see. That's one of the translations. While all of you are busy building your own fine ho ho houses. Does that make sense to us as we look at it? God was dealing with his people about priorities. That, that's, that's really what this is about. What does God say? When you look at your life and when, when I look at my life, 
What are my priorities? H how am I? Because I can say all sorts of things, but what I do shows my heart. Oh, I'm there. Oh, holy, holy, holy. I, I can say, I, I've been a preacher for how many years? I can, I'll bet you I know more scriptures than you do. I'll bet you I can say more holy things than you can say. It doesn't matter what I say. What matters is what I do. Not because of works, because God's not about works. He's, he's not that kind of God. But because what we do shows our heart and it shows our priorities. And we look at this and we think, wow, God's kind of tough. He blew all their efforts away. Hang with me. And then Zerubbabel and Joshua, the whole remnant of God's people, began to obey the message from the Lord their God. And when they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord their God had sent. Do you see that? It's not Haggai, is it? And that's, that's what I want you to hear and see this morning. It's not about Haggai. The, book of the, the two chapters of Haggai keep on saying, whom the Lord sent. The Lord says, the Lord says, seven times, five times, five times, the messenger of the Lord, the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. It's, it's throughout these two very short chapters. When they heard the words of the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord God had sent, the people showed reverence for the Lord. And what did they do? They began to rebuild. They began to rebuild. If you will make a move toward God, what I want to say to you is this. However hard it is, however difficult it is to get yourself and say, God, I'm serious. I'm going to do it. Here's what God says. I am with you, declares the Lord. The moment you turn to God, wherever you are in your walk with God, or if you have not yet begun a walk with God, the moment you do, God says to you, I am with you. And when God is with you, you can do anything. When God is with you, you can go anywhere. When God is with you, you can walk through the deepest valley. You can climb the highest mountain. When God is with you, whatever faces you. And so, the Lord stirred up the spirit. Do you know what that word stirred up means? I, I, I looked it up. I thought, does that mean something special? And it does mean something special. Do you know what it means? It means, hang on, I want to make sure I, I, I get it right. <laughs> stirred up means he opened the eyes. He woke up. Isn't that great? So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and Joshua, and all of the remnant. Do you think this morning, would it be okay if you heard the word of the Lord and you asked God to stir up your spirit? Would you like that? How about that? Sometimes we're asleep and we don't even know we're asleep, right? We don't even know we're asleep. I've told you before about my sister sitting in church, right? I, I could always stay awake because I was really a good girl in church. It wasn't because I was holy, and it wasn't even because I was listening always to the message. This is when I was really young, but it was because I was the pastor's daughter. So even if I was sleepy, I'd be sitting. I, I would. I'd just be sitting there like that because I, I, I worried about what people would think. Well, that shows you I'm just like these people, right? I, I am. I was just like, I'm not anymore, but I was just like these people. If you're sleepy this morning, I, I, I'm not hating on you. I, I'm not. That's not, that's not what this message is about. My sister, she would just be like a bobble dog. And I'd be like, she'd wake up. She'd be asleep before she even knew it. I'd be like this. But sometimes, honestly, we're asleep. We don't even know we're asleep. Or we're asleep and we don't care. We're asleep. I think these people didn't really care. And so the Lord stirred their spirit. And what did they do? They came and they began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty on September 21 in the second year of King Darius. When they begin, they work at it with all of their hearts 
because God is with them and they have listened to what God says. May I say something to you? The enemies around them were the same enemies. The enemies had not changed. The, the, the uh, resistance around them, it was still the same resistance. The people that were against them were still the people that were against them. Nothing had changed. Nothing outwardly had changed. Do you know what had changed? Their hearts had changed. Their spirits were stirred because they listened to what God said. And then they rebuilt the house of the Lord. And then God says, as he always does, we come to a close. Stay with me. Shake yourself if you're sleepy. Here's the original prosperity gospel. You ready for it? Here's the original prosperity gospel. God says, now, give careful thought from this day on. Think about how it used to be before you started rebuilding the altar, is what he's saying. When anyone came to a pile of grain expecting to find 20 basketfuls, there were only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, there were only 20. And that describes our lives, right? I thought, I thought being a Christian, I thought it was better than this. I thought following God was more satisfying. I, I, I thought if I gave my life to God, life would be better. Now, living as a Christian is not always easy. But what I want to say to us this morning is very often, in fact, usually, the dissatisfaction that we have with our lives in God is because we're just kind of playing around. Our hearts aren't where they can be, where God can really bless us abundantly as he wants to. Our priorities are turned around. And God says to us, us this morning, now, this is what I say. I'm your pastor, and I could sit and say, now, if you're doing this, 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 and this, you're playing around. And I thought of some things this week. But you know what? God said, Jennifer, you keep your mouth shut. He did. He said it three times, just in case I missed it the first two times. God said, I'll speak to people's hearts if they're playing around. I'll show them where priorities aren't as they should be. This is what I say. And so I urge you this morning to listen. What does God say? What does God say? And what God says is this. Here's the promise that comes from God. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. Because you all think God's hard. You all think God's being mean. You think God's being stingy. You think, come on, God, you bless them. Why don't you bless me? May I show you the heart of God? I mean this. May I show you the heart of God? God does what he does in our lives because he wants to have close relationship with us. This is why God does what he does. He's not being mean. He's not angry with you. He's not punishing you. God does not punish his children. I say it again. He does not punish his children. He punished Jesus on the cross for the wrongdoing you and I have done. God does not do that. But God will allow the results of the priorities that we have and the choices we make. Why? Come back to me. Get close with me. When you are with me in close fellowship, I'll walk with you. I'm with you. I'll bless you. I have abundant life for you. This is what I want. Young people, God is saying to you this morning, I have a good plan for your life. You're thinking, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. Watch out. This is what you say, but what do I say? What do I say? Now, here we go. The end. Then I'm going to tell you one more story. Ooh, I'll tell it fast. Whew. Be encouraged. Here's God's promise. From this day on, from this day on, verse 19, is the seed still in the barn? Your vines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crop. What is God saying? What is God saying to you this morning? This is where you are. 
you have seed. It's not even yet gone in the ground. Do you know what seed is? Seed is promise. Seed is hope. Seed is opportunity. Seed is possibility. But there it is. It's a little seed. Nothing has come from it yet. Or you've already got it in the field, but no fruit has come from it yet. And some of us, we've been walking with the Lord. It's, it's a twofold message for you here. The message for those of you that are contemplating, am I going to jump in and go all in with God and stop playing around? Am I going to do it or not, but it's going to cost a lot? What God is saying to you is this, do it. Listen to what I say, because from this day on, I will bless you. I will bless you. God wants to bless us. And you say, oh, I'm going to be rich. <clears throat> Maybe. But I don't think that's what God's talking about. What God is talking about here is an abundant, a blessed life. You can meet people who don't have a lot, but their lives are so full. They're so satisfied. Don't you love being around people who may not have a lot, but they're so happy and they're so satisfied? It's lovely to be around people like that. And when we're around people, like, I want to be like that. That's what God promises for us. That's what God has for us. So, f so for those of you that are saying, mm, young people, those of you, you that are thinking, mm, God says, if you will, I promise I'll bless you. Now, here's the other part of this message. Some of us, some of you, you've been walking with God. You've been faithful. And you haven't yet seen results. You've been praying, and you haven't yet seen results. Here is what God says to you this morning. God says, mark this. From this day on, I will bless you. This is the word of God to you this morning, brothers and sisters. If this has been in your heart, if you've been saying, God, I, I, God, I have been faithful. God, I, I have been following you. God, and God says to you, okay, the seed is still in the barn. There hasn't come fruit yet bless you. The answer you're praying for will surely come. Your priorities are right. You're living as you should. I'm going to bless you. The fruit will come. The blessing will come. The harvest will come. So, I was talking with mom this week. Here's the, end. Here's the story to close. And uh, you know mom's really old now. Some of you think I'm old. When I told, about a few months ago, I told Tobias how old I was. I'm, I was. I'm so sad I told Tobias how old I was. I'm so sad because Tobias thought I was about 40 years old. <laughs> I was so sad. And when he heard how old I was, <laughs> I thought, oh. So, but mom's a whole lot older. So I've been talking with mom this week, and she's been writing down some of her memories and some of her remembrances. And those of you that know mom, I mean, you know, just incredible things. And she didn't be writing the miracle, miracles and things, but she has started writing just some of the ways God worked in her life and worked in her heart. So Lighthouse would not be here right now without mom and dad, but mom was the other half of it. Lighthouse wouldn't be here without her. I wouldn't be here without her. Um, a lot of things would be different. And mom said, she said, I was always a good girl. Uh, her dad started the church in their home in Sarasota, Florida. They had about 25 people in the church. And mom was the youth leader. And she taught Sunday school. And she played the piano for the church. All of those things, okay? She was really a good girl. She was also a good student in school, as many of you are. And in school... Uh, she was the president of the girls' academic club or something like that. Very large high school. And at the end of the year, uh, the, the sponsor told all the girls, you've done so well this year, we're going to have a cruise in, in the harbor, in the bay. And this was a huge deal. They could never have afforded it. And, and the teacher said, um, of course, it would have been well chaperoned. And they said, you can invite someone. So when all the guys in the school heard about it, they were excited because this was a, a huge deal. And every girl could invite, could invite someone. And so mom invited, it was, maybe he was the most popular guy in her class. And uh, so, oh, they were so excited. They were so excited. There's nothing wrong with it. It was, it was, it was well chaperoned. It was a good cruise. It was a great, well, well planned. And then the week before that happened, they had special revival meetings in their home where the church was. And that Sunday morning, mom said, that he began to preach, and his message was, 
Choose who you will serve. And she said it was such a powerful message. She was 15 years old. Choose, choose today. Mom told me, I've known this story for many years, but mom said, I did not know this, that she had a diary. Nobody else saw it. And in her diary, every Sunday, she would write. Uh, by the way, I'll be short next week. I'm going to finish this story this week. Every Sunday, she would write, Dear God. How many of you write, Dear God, in your diaries? <laughs> Dear God, this week, I'm really going to serve you. Because she said she was a good girl, but she was playing around. She was, she was just kind of playing around. She wasn't really, really serious. She was good. Dear God, I'm going to serve you. And she said every Monday evening when she got home from school, she would write, failed again. <laughs> True story. That, that Sunday morning, he said, choose. And mom said she sat in her chair for about five minutes. And then he drew a line across the front. And he said, don't do this lightly. You think about it. You think about it. Choose. Choose. He said, if you choose, come up and cross the line. And Mom said she sat there for at least five minutes thinking about it. She was a good girl, but she's kind of playing around. And finally, she chose. Yes, God, I'm all in with you. And she got, she got up and she walked across the line. And she was so happy. She was so overwhelmed with joy. She was so glad. And then she went to school Monday. And at school Monday, she realized, oh! the trip, the harbor cruise was on Friday night. And there were meetings all week with this pastor. Monday, wonderful. Tuesday, wonderful. Wednesday, wonderful. And Thursday, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? The young man that she had asked was the most popular boy in the class. His name was Tommy Butler. I don't know if he's still alive or not. He's probably not because mom's almost 92. And Thursday she went to him and she said, Tommy, I can't go to the cruise. Why? Because she'd made a choice. She said, Tommy, I can't go. Why not? And she said, because I'm going to go to meetings at church. And by the way, her parents had let her make the decision. They didn't say, you have to. It's your choice. He was so angry because if she didn't go, he couldn't go. He was so angry. But Mom had made a choice. Friday night at the meeting, while everybody else was cruising, they had the meeting. And that night, Mom was baptized with the Holy Spirit. That night, God gave her a vision of people rushing to the edge of abyss, an abyss and falling in and not being able to come over to the side. And she asked God, God, why can't they come? And God said, because they haven't heard. And at 15, Mom said, God, I'll go, I'll go. And that was the night God dealt with her heart. That was the night God gave her a vision of a man dressed in Chinese clothes saying, come over here, come over here. That was when God dealt with her heart and her life was changed. And my life was changed. And for many of you, your lives have been changed. It doesn't matter what we say. It matters what God says. It matters what God says. And I'm telling you that story not to pull your heartstrings. Please, I'm, I'm not trying to pull your heartstrings. I, and I said, but mom, you, you would have been baptized in the Holy Spirit later. She told me this story on Friday. I said, you, but you would have whatever. And mom said, probably. She said, but I know that my life would have been different if I had gone on that cruise that night. And so, let's close in prayer. I thank you for your patience. I thank you for your listening. But I want, I want us just to pray as we close. I, I ask all of you to, young people, 
Not what I say. What does God say? Not what you say. What does God say? Where's your heart? Where's your priorities? Are you kind of, you're, a good, you're good, but you're kind of playing around. Do you want to keep on? God says, give careful thought. I want to bless you. This really is the original prosperity gospel. This really is. I want to bless you. I want to give you a life that is better than you could imagine. I want to give you fulfillment of heart that will go so far beyond anything your friends could give you, your classmates could give you, your workmates could give you, your money could give you, your efforts can give you. God says, I want to give you abundant life. God, we come to you this morning. Lord, I pray for myself. I pray for myself. And God, I want to make sure, and I pray for everyone here. Lord, for some of us, it's a big, it's a big thing, a big change. Lord, for some of us, it probably is smaller things in our lives, areas where our priorities are out of line with your priorities. God, I've been saying this about my life, but God, what do you say? God, I've been thinking about these choices, and I've been saying this, but God, what do you say? God, I've been treating your house. I've been treating your family. I've been treating you, and I've been treating your gathering casually and carelessly. What do you say about it? It hasn't bothered me very much, Lord. I've been asleep. God, would you stir my heart? Would you stir my heart? Would you wake us up? Would you wake us up? And I just want to give you, if the Lord is speaking to you this morning, I want to give you the, the opportunity just to respond to the Lord this morning. I'm not trying to make a, something dramatic or a big deal. But if you want to respond in some way to the Lord this morning, I, I invite you just to, you can raise your hands to the Lord if you want to. You can stand if you want to. If the Lord is, it's not what I'm saying or whatever, but if the Lord is speaking to you and you say, God, I, yeah, God, I hear what you're saying and this is, and I'm going to, I'm going to do something about it. Yes, Lord, this is what I'm going to do. I, I, I just invite you to respond to the Lord this morning in, in any way, in any way this morning. Yeah, just some of us are raising our hands. and I, 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 Hey, I'm not proud. I'm raising my hand. There are areas of my life, too, that God's been dealing with this week. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. God, help us, help us, help Lighthouse, help us not to live a, a half-life. Help us not to live a, a, a good life. But Lord, help us that our hearts are in line with you. Lord, that what you say is what we say. Your heart is our heart. Your priority is our priority. That we might live that we might live an abundant life, the abundant life that you have for us. Hey, this is a great chance to commit your life to the Lord this morning if you haven't. If you just say, ah, I've not, God, I've not really, I'm religious and I know a lot, but I'm, Lord, I'm not really walking with you, but I'd like to, I, I want to. This is a great time for you to do that too. Because God says, come to me, come to me. And if you want to, you can put up your hand for that this morning. Say, God, I really, I want to walk with you in my life. I, I, want, I want to walk with you. I want to do what you say. I, I, Lord, I don't want to live my own way. I want to live your way. And God is just waiting for that. He's happy to hear that. Amen. That's right. That's right. And so what God says to you is, I will be with you. I will be with you. So some of you have raised your hands, and I'm going to help you. Let's pray a prayer of commitment this morning. Lord, I have heard what you've said.
to me this morning. And I commit my life to you. Thank you for not judging me. Thank you for not condemning me when I have been careless and casual, when I've gone my own way. But Lord, I come to you and I receive your promise and I receive your presence. You are with me. And God, I pray you will work in my life and do what you want to do. Your priorities will be my priorities. Your plans will be my plans. What you say is what I will say. Thank you for your promise that from this day on, you will bless me. Thank you. In Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you. Appreciate your, your, your patience and your perseverance as we went through this. Youth, I know you've got lunch in the afternoon. The, they're going to heat up their food first, and then the youth have the fourth floor. And God bless you. <laughs>